Welcome everyone to the lecture about applied bioimage analysis. My name is Robert. This is my kitchen. Um, and I'm going to guide you through this semester of image analysis. And uh, let's see what it will be about. So bioimage analysis um, basically means uh, processing images, images from microscope usually. Um, and that can be filtering like post-processing images in some certain ways, image segmentation, finding objects and images, registering images, so different images showing the same scene and bringing information from these images together or tracking objects and images and stuff like that. And in order to actually analyze images, of course, you want to do measurement in images. And I would like to show you how this works. We will spend the major part of this semester on these topics. We will do most of the stuff in ImageJ and Fitchy and Python, um, but I nevertheless would also like to introduce you to tools like IC, Elastic, UPath, Nime, Cell Profiler, and see if you manage all of them. At the end, the goal, what you should learn during this semester, is how do you quantify um, observations in image. So we will also spend some time on machine learning. So machine learning uh, is a kind of, let's say, a modern way of uh, image processing, image analysis. And you can actually teach a computer to, uh, uh, under to understand the image to a certain degree, for example, to identify objects, where they are, what they are, or actually whole images. You can actually also process images in a way that the computer can tell you what it is in this particular image. Um, I, it's also my duty to introduce you to programming. So uh, we will do programming in ImageJ. I will teach you the ImageJ macro language. And we will do most of the image analysis and image processing part in ImageJ or Fiji. Um, but we will also learn, you will also learn something about data analysis and statistics. And this part is actually more often uh, programmed in Python. So that's why I will also learn, teach you some Python. Um, and the goal here is to automate your image analysis workflow so that you don't have to do everything by hand and doing measurements by hand and processing images by hand. The goal is that you, by the end of the semester, know how to do these things automatically. The, in order to quantify measurements, in order to get something reasonable out of your experiments, which you may later do during your career, right? Um, I will teach you some biostatistics, um, so some general biostatistics, so that we have the same terminology, you know what we are talking about. But I will mostly concentrate on how to, how to measure differences between different uh, mutants, controls, experimental conditions stuff like that. So this is a practical course, right? So I, I don't want to show you the whole field of bio, uh, biostatistics. I just want to give you the tools which are good for you uh, in uh, fulfilling your goals in your scientific, potentially scientific career. Um, this is the rough plan for this semester. So we will start uh, for the first month for April, we will do ImageJ, some image processing, image filtering, then ImageJ macro programming. By the end of April, we will do some uh, machine learning. There I will show you Elastic. Um, then we will go further image registration and tracking. Uh, so that's kind of processing videos um, in a scientific way. Um, and then in uh, June, uh, we will uh, switch over to Python. So then we will leave a bit the image processing field and do more uh, uh, data analysis, more with numbers, tables. Um, and uh, getting some 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 reasonable information out, and that also means that we do the biostatistics part mainly in Python. Um, by the end of the semester, there will be an exam, and uh, in this exam, you can actually choose which programming language you use. So, if you if you prefer ImageJ Macro, you can do everything you should do in the exam in Macro, um, and if you prefer Python, you can do everything in Python. And as this question often comes up. Um, I'm, I will not ask you to write an exam with a whole, let's say, 100-line program. That's not realistic, right? So the idea is more like if you can program little five-line code programs uh, on a sheet of paper. So it's like it, it, it will be doable. Um, it's a quite practical course. So uh, I would like to enable you analyzing data. So that means you will analyze a lot of data during the exercises uh, after every lecture. Um, and therefore, I have a lot of images you can analyze. I can give you a lot of data to process. But if you have from a different project, from a different lecture, or from, from a friend, whatever, um, some, some data you would be interested in analyzing, I'm happy to put this into the exercises uh, for this semester. So just drop me an email, send me some data, and then I can see what I can do with it. Um, that's basically the introduction for the whole semester. Today, 
Um, the I will give you a short introduction to image analysis. I will show you what pixels, boxes, lookup tables are. Um, and I will give you a short introduction to image shape Fitchy so that you know how to visualize data, how to manually annotate objects, and to, uh, to do some basic measurements. Afterwards, you um, get a link uh, to some exercises. And then we will later have a Zoom meeting where you can then actually, together with me, talk about the exercises, how it went, and what the problems were. So let's start with the introduction to bioimage analysis. Um, so if people think about image analysis, you often first of all think about a camera and you think about a scene. Um, and then you can do certain things with images, like you can, for example, change a bit the contrast. You can also remove objects you are not so happy about. And the first take home message is, this is image beautification, not image analysis. Sometimes we do things like that for better visualization in the, for example, when you want to make a figure ready for publication, yes, then you do things like that to, to increase the contrast, to show an object in a better way, but it's actually not so popular and actually not so scientifically correct to do these kind of operations in a scientific image analysis workflow. Nevertheless, sometimes we actually have to do things like this. So think about here, we acquired an image like that and we subtract the other image I just showed you. And then we have kind of only the term, only the characters, only the letters left. So this image is of course much easier to analyze. So sometimes we do these kind of tricks, yes, to get a better measurement or to actually enable other measurements. So, um, for example, for feature extraction. The tools we use are things like, uh, first of all, <laughs> the tools we use is not a camera, it's a microscope. Um, and then tools, software tools we use are like Fiji, Cell Profiler, Python, Secret Image, and the others I managed, man mentioned. And um, yeah, of course, also our microscopes look a bit more fancy. So here you, for example, see a lighting microscope from the lab where I'm working in. Um, what we do then is typically things like that. We acquire a multi-channel image, like in this case, and then we do some, some, some channel extraction. We only look at the blue channel in this case. We do a segmentation, so we turn the image, which had many, many different gray values, many uh, signal intensities. We turn it into a binary image, and from the binary image, we can then derive some measurements. So this is kind of the usual image analysis workflow we do. Um, and what is also quite important uh, is, especially for, the, for, the, for people in, in early career, is to accept that image analysis is a part of the experiment. Image analysis is not the last thing you do and then it's done. It's not like the end of something. It is actually part of a circle. So let's assume we have an observation. So for example, we observed this fruit fly and we want to, to understand a bit better how, for example, its development happens, right? So we take a microscope, we make some images of, uh, in this case, Drosophila embryo, then we do image processing. So we take an image and we make different images out of it. So in this case, that's a parametric image. I will show you later what that means. And then we do image analysis. So we get kind of numbers out of the image. And then we can do, for example, some modeling. Then we have kind of a theoretical, physical, biophysical model of what is happening. And this model allows us to set up a new experiment and to go back to the microscope and check uh, if our model actually fits to the data. And so well, what you see here, this is a circle. So we are kind of going through the circle again and again, over and over. So an experiment is not like something you start at some point and then it's done at some other point. Um, we, we are going in these circles and it's like absolutely normal to do so. And it's not like a, a, a matter of failure um, if, if we have to go through the circle several times. We have to go through the circle several times anyway. So some properties of bioimage analysis is actually properties of science itself or of good scientific practice. Let's say it like that. Um, so bioimage analysis is supposed to be quantitative. So let's look at these images. I'll give you a second. What's different between these images? Of course, we can tell that in some way. For example, uh, the image on the left uh, contains more mandarins than the image on the right. But it means I mixed up left and right. Hmm, happens. <laughs> um, the image on the right <laughs> uh, contains several mandarins, so we can say things like that, right? So uh, we, we could we could uh, uh, do it like this, but actually we want to have quantitative measurements. So mandarin count on the left zero, on the right three. 
So getting actual numbers out of images and not like rough estimations or judgments of a human. So the idea is really like to get numbers, quantitative measurements out of images. Um, furthermore, it's supposed to be objective. So when you ask three experts to outline the tumor in a positron emission tomography data set, you may get something like this. And of course, every observer outlines the object in a different way. And if you do this in 3D, like in this experiment, we did it in 3D. Um, you have also some kind of error propagation between different planes of the data set. So uh, it can kind of sum up the error in a way that we have differences of something like 50% or depending on how you see it, like a difference of 100% between these different observers. And ideally, of course, we want to have a computer who does the segmentation automatically without a judgment of a person. If you ask the same person to outline a volume several times, it is very unlikely that Every pixel, every segmentation piece is uh, outlined in exactly the same way. So, but the computer can do it in exactly the same way because it's kind of an automated program which you run again and which will result, hopefully, ideally, in the same contour. So, back to the mandarins, back to the oranges. So, I can program a program uh, which is uh, which takes these two images. The program looks like that. It's actually in the folder where also the slides are, so feel free to try it out. Um, this program takes these two images and does a quantitative measurement number of objects in this image. So it counts two. And what we learned from that, I mean, this I can re I can repeat this program and I can run it again and it will be again the same number and it is kind of uh, objective, <laughs> right? But it's wrong. It's not reliable. So uh, reliability of image analysis is also an important thing. In case of two objects or three objects, it's quite easy. But what if you have a microscopic image with 1,000 cells, where the computer tells you that there are 800 in there? So it's like not so obvious to see. Um, but nevertheless, image analysis must be reliable in, in whatever way. And that's an ideal condition, right? Um, furthermore, reproducibility. And therefore, I... Um, prepared a little experiment. So uh, this is my experimental setup. I have this box, um, I have this mandarin, and I will now drop it. And you hear a weird sound, right? So uh, why does this orange, why does this mandarin uh, make this sound? And I can show it again, and uh, and it's it's really weird. So could you reproduce my experiment? Could you do this experiment with the same result, that we hear this weird sound, right? So this is a not reproducible experiment because you do not fully see what I am doing. But however, if I remove this box and if I tell you that this is a cup and this is an orange and sometimes this sound happens and sometimes it doesn't, uh, <laughs> you can repeat this, uh, you can reproduce this experiment because it's fully documented. This is a cup, this is a mandarin and I drop the one thing into the other. So this is about um, reproducibility. Reproducibility has something to do with uh, with the way how I document my experiment. And I can only allow you in, 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 in reproducing my experiment if I document it in a way that you know all the steps and all the tools you need in order to do it. Um, so this is reproducibility. And as a term which sounds very similar, but which is actually quite different, it's repeatability. So Reproducibility is a thing which has something to do with documentation, with commun communication between different uh, people who want to do an experiment. Um, repeatability is, an is, is a property of the experiment itself. So I have uh, this orange and I drop it into the cup. And I can repeat this experiment with the same cup and with the same orange. I can do it as often as I want, right? So um, that's just doable. Uh, let's change the experimental setup in a little bit and see if it's still repeatable. This is an egg. I will now not drop it into this cup. But do you think this experiment is repeatable? Could I do it again with the same egg? Maybe not. And that's a property of the experiment. It does not have something to do with documentation, right? So that's the difference between repeatability um, and reproducibility. So to just summarize these five properties, right? We want to have all the experiments we do, all the image analysis we do, we want to have it quantitative. We want to have ideally numbers coming out of our experiments. 
We want to have it objective, so it's not like a person sitting in front of a screen judging a data set. We want to have a computer doing it ideally, automatically, resulting in a number, which is kind of really related to, to the thing we want to measure. That's also reliability, right? We are confident that the measurement the computer gives us has actually something to do with the physical property we wanted to investigate, right? Reproducibility is a property which comes from, from uh, documentation of, of the experiment, experiment we are doing. So somebody else can repeat, can reproduce our um, experiment under maybe even different conditions and while getting similar uh, uh, results. And repeatability means that we can do the same experiment twice under the same conditions and get similar measurements out. It's actually quite important also in deep learning business more and more people are calling like that. Um, if possible, that you can kind of image the same image twice, please do that. Because then you have kind of two images which show, which show the same scene. And if you then apply, for example, deep learning algorithms to that, you can a bit investigate how the influence of, for example, noise is um, to the result of your, of your post-processing with deep learning techniques. Common questions bioimage analysts are answering are things like how is the signal intensity under different conditions in my images? How many cells are in this image? How high is the cell density? And how, what can you, for example, judge? Or what, what can you, for example, know from different cell uh, density? For example, if you look in a histological image like this one, um, you can actually quite nicely differentiate uh, the, the region where there are not so many nuclei and the region where there are many nuclei and you can then say something like, okay, this is muscle tissue and this is a tumor. So this is kind of very important for, for especially for medicine in this particular case. And if you want to um, characterize different tissues, different images, different, different properties of images, machine learning plays a big role. Um, furthermore, typical questions image analysts usually struggle with is what force is driving this process we observe here? Or what is the lineage tree of this particular one cell? Is uh, our observ observations A and B related? So these are questions which are hard to answer. Especially measuring forces in images is like, I would say impossible because we are looking at the result of light interacting with our sample. So if you want to now measure a physical force, something pushing, pulling, traction, it's it's super hard to set experiments up where you can then get measurements out of that out of images, um, and furthermore, for example, co-localization is a technique which is I would not say much a, an active research field, so you can just do co-localization, but co-localization is uh, um, quite complicated. So many people use it in the wrong way, I'm afraid, uh, because often it's not like you don't want to know if things are co-localized. You actually want to know if the one thing is close to another thing, if there is a membrane to a nucleus or stuff like that. It's not exactly co-localization and that's why these questions are sometimes a bit harder to answer than for example just counting nuclei in an image. Right? So, um, and when you set up your experiment um, I would always kind of recommend some, some, some hints. So for example think about your uh, image analysis before you start the experiment. You should actually already have a rough idea of how to analyze the images resulting from an experiment before you perform the experiment. Or run a test experiment in advance to see if the images which come out there are actually analyzable to some degree. Think about controls, think about counterproofs, think about an easy to falsify null hypothesis. So we will come back to this later in the statistics part, how to do these things properly. Um, and also think about how to exclude yourself from the experiment. So you saw when I was dropping the orange in the cup, sometimes the sound appeared, sometimes it didn't. So maybe that has something to do with me. Me, I'm throwing this orange in the wrong way into the cup. So if, you, if there is a way of performing this experiment without a human in the loop, maybe the results would be uh, uh, more uh, uh, reliable. Um, and usually uh, one experiment only answers one question. Uh, I would actually say in most of the cases it's like one experiment does not answer a question, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's science, right? So uh, that's absolutely normal and you don't have to be kind of worried about an experiment going wrong. So you learn something from it anyway and sometimes an experiment actually answers a question. So this is what we are heading for, right? Okay, that's uh, the, the general introduction part. Now let's come to terminology. So terminology is, um, starts with images and pixels. So an image is just a matrix of numbers and a pixel is a part of it, it's a picture element. So 
and we zoom in this image, we can see actually kind of a grid of pixels. So that's the pixels, right? And they have different gray values, and these gray values are actually just numbers in a table. So you can actually express this image also as a table of numbers. And the edges you see here between the pixels are actually not there. It's just something we get out of our computer because of the way how the images are acquired, the way of how the images are saved on the hard drive. In fact, in the real sample, in the real world, these edges do not exist. And uh, every pixel has their pixel size. So for example, a pixel width and a pixel height. And uh, this is a, a property you set up during the imaging session at the microscope. So let's look at this image. I hope you can see that. We have here a pixel size of three microns, and we can see that there are some bluish pixels here. If I now decrease the pixel size, so I make smaller pixels and I have in the same area more pixels, I can suddenly see the objects in a better way. And when I make the pixel size very small, I can actually also see that there was a green and a red channel with additional information of, of other objects in our scene, right? So this is pixel size. And pixel size is just a property of how the digital data set is have been saved to disk. This has nothing to do with resolution yet. Resolution is something different. Resolution is actually a property of your imaging system. Um, it tells us something about um, how close objects in an image can be so that we can still differentiate them. So let's look at that image. I will again zoom in a bit and I have drawn a line here. There's my mouse. I have drawn a line here through this green channel and I'm now plotting the intensity along this line in the plot. And I can clearly see that there are two objects. So the intensity is bright here and it's bright here and in between it's not. So it's like one, two things are in this image. So when I go here from the left to the right, you will agree that maybe um, there's this bent object here which appears in this dimension like two objects. If I now look at the same image, it's a bit blurred, right? It could be acquired with a different microscope, for example. Um, I actually don't see this so well. So I can could still say maybe there are two objects, but maybe not. I cannot clearly differentiate them, and that's the terminology. The resolution is not enough to differentiate these two objects. So the resolution here is actually worse, like in this case. Um, and there's, a, there's another uh, thing. Some people actually call resolution, it's kind of the, the, the gray value resolution, the correct term for that would be bit depth. So a bit is the smallest memory unit in, computer, in computers, so it's the atomic piece of data. Um, and the bit depth of an image actually tells us how many different gray values we can have. So if we have a bit depth of one, that means uh, two to the power of one, we can have two different gray values. If we have a bit depth of two, we can have four different gray values and so on. Um, microscopic images are usually saved as 8-bit, 12-bit, 16-bit. So most of the microscopes do it like this. And to just show you how, how in an image, in this case a medical image, it looks like. So we, we are looking here at an MRI data set, uh, usually saved in 12 or 16-bit. So this is how the image usually looks like. And if I cut it, if I crop it down to a bit depth of two, you see that you cannot really differentiate uh, 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 bright and dark matter anymore. Um, it's like you don't have enough different gray values to express the full uh, information which was in this data set. So the message here to take home is the lower uh, the bit depth is, the less information we have in this image. And we can go from a 16-bit image to a 2-bit image or to a 1-bit image. That's doable, and we do that quite often in image analysis. But we cannot go in the other direction. So it's like the information is lost. So there are some pitfalls related to, for example, 8-bit images. So an 8-bit image, that's uh, 2 to the power of 8 different gray values. So you have 256 different gray values available you can save your, your pixels in. Usually that's the numbers from 0 to 255. And depending on uh, what software you are using, there may go some things wrong. Assume you want to subtract one image from another, for, for, for example, like I showed you uh, at the very beginning. Um, of this lecture. And you have now a pixel with intensity uh, 100 and you want to subtract a pixel with an intensity of 200. You get, you would like to get a negative number out, right? Minus 100, but unfortunately you cannot because this uh, 
gray value range from zero to the power of 55 does not contain negative values. So you cannot express negative values with that. And the software will kind of say, okay, it's negative, but I cannot do it, so I will just put it to zero. So that happens. So we can later on in Fiji, we can try that. I can show you how this works. There's, and there's other software where weird things like this are happening. So it takes the 100, it subtracts 200, so it would actually be minus 100, but this minus 100 it cannot express. So it starts again from the highest number, 255, and subtracts one, the remaining 100, right? So we end up in 155. Depending on which software you use, these things are, are happening at States Middle Lake. It's, it's happening, and the results look super weird. Um, furthermore, the other way around, of course, um, if you add two images with values of 100 and 200, it may just crop that off at 255, um, or it starts again at zero, um, and adds the remaining 45, resulting in such a way. So it really depends on the software you're working with, and you just should be aware that if you subtract images, or if you do math with pixels in general, I would say avoid the bit depth 8. So I'll show you later how this works. Um, it's just like keep that in mind when doing math with pixels. Um, furthermore, that's a visualization thing. Lookup table. The so-called lookup table is a table where you have two columns. The one column is um, pixel value, and the other column is display color. So how is this pixel value displayed on screen? So in this case, the pixel value 0 corresponds to black, and 255 corresponds to white. And this is what our resulting image looks like. So it's just a mapping. So it's just like the computer looks up how this particular value should be expressed on screen. So this is how, how it can look like, and we can also put different lookup tables on our images. So in this case, the pixel value 0 is displayed in white, and the display value 255 is displayed in black. And that's why the image looks inverted. But what you should keep in mind when applying a different lookup table to an image is that the image is still the same. The numbers in here are identical to the numbers in this image. So this is the same image, it's just displayed with a different lookup table. And you can do this in a super weird way, like for example this way, where you say, okay, the pixel value number zero corresponds to violet or red, um, and the pixel value of 255 is black or blue or something like that, right? And then you have, again, a completely different looking image, but it just looks different. It is in memory, in the computer, still the same image. We just see it in a different way on the screen. So that's what the lookup table does for us. Um, and you can, for every image, for visualization, choose different lookup tables. And what I'm saying here is, um, please choose these lookup tables wisely. So usually when I do this lecture uh, in front of people and then ask, is there somebody in the room who is red, green, blind? There's, among 50 people, usually there's one person or some, or maybe two, um, who, who have this issue. So there are definitely a lot of red, green, blind people. And they would now say, yeah, the image on the left and the image on the right look exactly the same, but uh, all the other people in the room may not agree on that. So we have here an image of a green channel and a red channel, and this is like yellowish. And it appears to people who are red, green, blind, it appears like that. And in order to improve the visualization for, for people with this, uh, with this problem, um, replace red with magenta. So unfortunately, in many programs, uh, many image processing programs, red and green is kind of the standard visualization, the standard lookup tables for a two-channel image. Um, and I would like to ask you to, whenever you can, think about that and remove red and replace it by magenta, because then the, also the red, green, blind people can actually see the difference between these two channels. Um, I think last but not least, a histogram is kind of a way to, from a statistical point of view, uh, make an image interpretable. So for example, if you look at this image, um, we get a histogram out of that. Um, and it tells us something about the intensity on the, on the x-axis and the number of pixels which are there, which have this number. So you may, for example, agree um, that this histogram tells us that there's a lot of pixels with uh, intensity between, let's say, 0 and 30. And there are also a lot of pixels with intensity between 180 and 200. Um, and think about lookup tables, yeah, so actually the lookup table is here on the x-axis. Whenever you look at the histogram, um, try to imagine for yourself the lookup table here on the x-axis. So it tells us there is some black pixels and there is some white pixels, but there are not so many gray pixels. 
And there are two different kind of histograms quite popular in software. It's like on the one side you see um, the pixel count on the y-axis and in the other case you see the frequency. So that's kind of divided by the number of pixels in the whole image. The frequency um, of pixels in this particular image with a given intensity. You see the curve is the same, it's just the y-axis which is different. And histograms are kind of summaries of images. Later in the exercise, you will go through some images and you will uh, look at some histograms to get a bit of feeling of what that means. So in this particular region of this image, the histogram will look like that. And in a different region, or actually in a different image, the histogram looks like this. And you can see that this image here is sharper than this one. So it's kind of, that was, by the way, that's a misalignment of a microscope. The difference you see here, so this is better aligned than that one. Um, and you can see here that I can see the objects better, and that means that this hill here uh, in the histogram, which is kind of higher here, is wider. And this wider means that the information in the image is distributed over more different gray values. So there's not just gray, there's also white. And here in this case, it's just gray and no white. And this is what you actually see here in this region. And this is how people read histogram. So a histogram tells us something about the distribution of gray values. So that's the first part for now. Um, I just showed you what image analysis is supposed to be. It's supposed to be quantitative, objective, reproducible, repeatable, reliable. Um, I also told you about what pixels, voxels, and so are. What's the difference between resolution and pixel size? And I also explained to you what uh, lookup tables and histograms are. And um, this is kind of the, 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 the very basics. So we will come for sure back to pixels for the whole semester. And we will at the one or the other point talk about resolution again and about pixel size. And whenever you program, so you will program something during the semester, right? Whenever you program an image processing and image analysis workflow, think about how to make this repeatable, reproducible, reliable, objective and quantitative. So we will come back to this again and again. Um, coming up next is an introduction to Fiji. So this part of the lecture was mostly theoretical and I also would like to show you um, some practical application of all that. So I will take five minutes break. Um, you are welcome to continue with the next video right away. Um, and then afterwards, after I have introduced you to Fiji, you can actually do the exercises which you find online as well.